welcome to the leaders of tomorrow in ET now the only indian television show where you the msme entrepreneur get the opportunity to have your voice heard and have all your questions answered no matter what area or industry you're from today we're in conversation with harsh mariwala he's a chairman of course of marico he needs no introduction he's also now the founder of ascent Thank you very much for speaking with us here on the Leaders of Tomorrow and ET Now. So mm-hmm. such a pleasure to have you when we are. My pleasure to be with you. Thank you once again. Uh, maybe I can start mm-hmm. by talking first about Ascent. Mm-hmm. Why you felt the need for that? What the journey behind that has been? So Ascent uh, started about five years back, and we made a beginning in the city of Bombay. Um, this is my way of giving something back to the society. because uh, i strongly believe that entrepreneurs add a lot of value to all the stakeholders we have more than 300 entrepreneurs uh, associated with uh, ascent uh, and um, even in terms of a break up you know about almost 51% manufacturing 49% services i think about 37% coming from family managed organization almost 15 20% uh, women entrepreneurs so what i'm trying to say is that whole group of 300 entrepreneurs were a part of ascent um i think it's a diverse lot in terms of uh, background in terms of the sectors they are coming in we are virtually representing each and every sector of entrepreneurs is a part of ascent and anyone can apply to ascent yes, is it's it? uh, okay. it's very easy it's uh, it doesn't cost anything to apply uh it's uh one has to go to the ascent website and uh put in an application only thing you have to be um having a minimum turnover of 5 crores if you are in a manufacturing sector or 1 crore if you are in services sector number 2 it the business should at least be breaking even ideally making profits and um once you apply then we start uh, uh shortlisting the applications and then the shortlisted candidates are called for a group interaction uh, at our office what we do in that group interaction is we try to see how driven is the entrepreneur because we want entrepreneurs who who are ambitious um who are also willing to help others so we look at their business model we look at uh, their desire to grow and we also look at how they participate in a group setting so most of the discussions in that group interactions are in group setting and then there are individual interviews also so the selection process is a bit rigorous we want so it's more a merit based entrepreneurship yes, and program and we want to be very selective because the whole model is based on peer to peer learning and if you select if you don't select good entrepreneurs then the whole model goes for a for a big sixer what ascent has enabled is to actually get entrepreneurs from different industries uh which are non competing okay you were talking earlier about you know one or two things you look amongst the uh for amongst the applicants who come to ascent yes. if there are one or two things that yes. you think an entrepreneur should definitely possess what kind of qualities would you look for see i would say that for any entrepreneur to succeed in a highly competitive environment it's very important that the entrepreneur has a strong he creates a wrong strong right to win so i'm saying that in a competitive environment compared to many other competitors who my face in my sector i have something which enables me to win okay. now in an fmcg space it could be some brands it could be some innovations and that right to win has to be sustainable just because you have created a right to win today doesn't not mean that you will perpetually have the right to win so as the competition catches up with you you have to create more and more moats around you so that others uh, you are trying to protect yourself and others are not able to copy you you know a usp in Absolute, some sense yes. okay so let me flip that around yes. we love asking the experts who come on our show if uh-huh. entrepreneurship is something that can be learned and yes. something that can be taught <laughs> see i see that increasingly many um, courses are offered uh for time courses by some management institutes 
there are short term programs also. So, there is a certain part which definitely can be learned uh, and should be learned. So, I think it is uh, some of the entrepreneurs get driven by their own ideas, but they may have some gaps uh, in their way of working and the gaps could be centering around their leadership style and I think that is something which can be and should be learned. It centers around their ability to attract talent, centers around their ability to delegate, uh, how to create a business model, how to create a business plan, how do you create a right to win, what kind of resources you need to generate to start a business and what are the options available in terms of financial resources, should it be a loan, should it be a seed fund, should it be a venture capitalist or whatever other options there could be. So, I think a lot of that could be learnt and I, I strongly believe that uh, there are good options available for entrepreneurs to learn. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, when you are running a business, you face day to day issues which are not taught at the management school. So, and that and that is what we are trying to do. Uh, to fill in that gap at the entrepreneur's end, how do I deal with a strike? Now, that can never be taught in a business school because the whole situation in terms of that particular case may be different in one company compared to other. So, if I get an opportunity of discussing with 10 other entrepreneurs about my issue, whatever issue it is, you know, it could be relating to strike or it could be relating to how do I manage my partners, how do I delegate, how do I maintain work life balance, uh, how do I create right to win, how do I prepare a business plan is something which I think 10 other people are putting themselves in your shoes and that diversity of thoughts is something which cannot be taught. Okay. So, uh, you were saying earlier that it is lonely at the top. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur is yeah. definitely something that you are either doing by yourself or maybe with one other person. Yes. But there is definitely an ecosystem that is required and sure. if you look at what is sure. happening in the US or in yes. Israel, yes. there is a very vibrant ecosystem. Yes. What will take India to that level? See, I think first of all, um, I see that internally uh, when I visit management schools, when I speak, there is a very high desire to become entrepreneurs. So, the fact that we have had some success stories in India of many entrepreneurs making it big and uh, really big, I mean there are enough examples of Flipkart or Paytm or many others you know, who have started from nothing and they become billionaires you know. So, I think some key success stories have led this aspiration at a personal level. So, if I find that there are 10 people who have succeeded. Uh, and they have made it big, why not me? The other thing is if you are coming from a good management school, there is always a backup option if that business does not do well and need not be that every business will do well. I can always go back to the job market you know. So, there is a fallback option available in today's environment because of lack of good quality talent in the corporate sector. So, if I do not succeed as a businessman, I can always join an organization if I am well qualified and I can make a career out of it. So, the risk appetite of Indian students, Indian youngsters have grown dramatically in the last few years. So, that is the starting point I would say. Now, to create an ecosystem you need much more than that. So, I would say that what happens in Silicon Valley in terms of the educational institutions, um, the whole incubation centers, uh, the venture capitalists, the whole financing world, uh, the HR world in terms of consultants and all, I think that needs to take deeper roots. It has started in certain parts of the country, but I see entrepreneurship growing all across the country. So, we need more and more of these centers, especially in those areas where genetically those communities are far more entrepreneurial. For example, Gujarat is an entrepreneurial community, um, Rajasthan, Marwadis are entrepreneurial. You know. So, there are certain communities where it is a part of their genetic uh, uh, growing up and this is, this is a strong point, it is genetic coding. And I think uh, we need to spread this and um, we need to do much more in terms of the technology transfers from abroad to here, the role technology can play. So, I would say technology, uh, education, incubation centers. So, many times you may have a technology, but you do not have 
a place to test out the technology. So, if there are incubation centers which are started by the government or some other private, then you actually go to the incubation center which has a lot of uh, equipment where you can test out things. And um, I think depending on how your experience is, you can actually try and decide whether you want to go into business. Mm. Speaking of the ecosystem, I want to talk about the role that the government yes. uh, possibly does and yes. should do for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. A lot of entrepreneurs tell us it's best if the government maintains a hands-off approach. So I think the government's role is catalytic and the government's role is not to start a business, that's for sure. So to that extent, I agree that the sh government should not evaluate entrepreneurs, but they can play a catalytic role. And that catalytic role can come in through set up of, set up of incubation centers, um, talking about stories of entrepreneurs, uh, have technology transfer agreements with countries like Israel and many others. So the entrepreneurs have many other options to choose from. But having done that, then I think it should be left to the entrepreneurs. Even colleges where, you know, uh, it can be taught. So I think that's the role of the government to play a catalytic role, but not to actually hold entrepreneurs hand and say that, okay, we are investing in your company or we want you to evaluate your business because that's not what the government should be doing. Mr. Marivella, do hold that thought. We'll take a very quick break, but much more on the other side with the chairman of Marico. Do stay tuned. Welcome back with us here on the Leaders of Tomorrow and today on The Crux, we are in conversation with Harsh Mariwala, Chairman Mariko. Um, I want to talk about some of the areas of your business that you've been personally responsible for driving, for example, uh, say uh, Kaya as a business. I don't want to go into the specifics of sure, that, sure. but that is a brand. Yes. What helped you identify that, yes, this is going to be a business and a segment that's going to do well? Normally, when you have an existing team which is doing a day-to-day -day job, and when you ask them to look at a new business, invariably it doesn't get the right attention because they have to do their day-to-day -day job. So, and when you pull out one or two people and then their whole life or their time is dependent on creating a new business, they have enough time, there are no escape buttons and they tend to think differently. So, I just pulled out one person and we made it very clear within Marico that we want to be viewed as a team which is a startup and not part of a larger organization. So how do you create a small company culture in a larger organization was a challenge. So after pulling out this person, it was made very clear to all the other staff functions uh, and everybody else that this will be treated like a small entrepreneurial outfit and considering that we will not go through the organizational processes of approvals and all which can slow down things because speed is very important in entrepreneurial journey. So, and because I was involved, I was able to, so we just worked like a small entrepreneurial team within a large organization by doing away with all the approvals, processes, um, things like that. And the fact that he was solely responsible for creating a new business, it really helped a lot in terms of gaining momentum and speed. And we were, from the time we got the idea to the time we went in business, it took maybe one, one to one and a half years. And if I had not done that, I would not have entered the business. Or even if I had entered the business, it would have taken maybe three, four, five years because it would get delayed. And here it was just focus in terms of moving forward. And even things like market research, normally you do a lot of market research in FMCG. But in a startup, you, have, you don't have those big budgets. So we have to have the mindset of a small entrepreneur. So we did some dipstick study. I called, as I said, some friends. Uh, gave them rather than doing a huge market research uh, which one would spend a lot of money but did more of consumer inciting rather than a structured expensive market research. Mm. So what are the opportunities then for small FMCG and small companies mm. to be able to compete effectively against larger peers especially yes. in an industry like yours which yes. is so fragmented you have a lot of players at the bottom end and a lot of players at the top end. See I think first of all you must understand that creating brands and creating brands in an FMC sector is, is difficult. Globally, it has been proven that maximum 10 to 20% of the brands succeed. 
and even the biggest companies and the most respected companies in FMCG space have failures. So I think first of all the mindset is that everything is not going to succeed and there is going to be high degree of failure. And if then I think it is for the CEO of any FMCG company to instill within their team that you have to experiment. If you don't experiment, you will never know whether it succeeds and beyond a point market research has its own limitations. So we encourage our people to experiment, to prototype, do it on a small scale. If it is successful, then try and scale it up. And many times it, there are failures, but you don't punish failures. If I punish a failure by not giving increment or not promoting that person, yeah, even though he's capable, then nobody in the organization will take risks. So that's one way of looking at it from an FNC angle. Now your specific question in terms of how do you create a brand? I think compared to the last uh, past, maybe four or five years back, we thought we had a big entry barrier because of distribution. And it is very expensive to maintain a national distribution because you need to have a field force, you need to have distributors, and you need to have a certain critical mass in terms of turnover. Uh, and unless you have a thousand crore plus turnover, you can't afford to maintain this. Um, you could do it through wholesale channel, but it has limitations. But I think what has emerged in the last two, three years is that emergence of digital brands. So if you're a digital brand today, you don't need to distribute it physically. You know? And the money which is required to promote a digital brand is much, much less compared to what you would spend on creating a FMCG typical brand where you need to advertise on television, press, because you don't do it, you do it through social media. So your entry barriers all of a sudden in terms of advertising budgets as well as distribution infrastructure are eliminated in today's world. And we are seeing so many brands getting emerging out of this space. Um, and making quite big. So, But is I, it possible to have uh, an online as well as an offline presence? Is it essential to do both? Because a lot of companies are doing that. I think a, a lot depends on the potential you have. Mm. So if you have big dreams, then you need to have both because currently online accounts for a small percentage of total turnover for big FNG companies in the range of 1 or 2 percent. It will grow to 5, 10 percent. So the scope in online is limited, but if you have big ambitions, then you may start off online. If there is traction, then you go offline because you see that that product has traction in the marketplace. So there are many brands which have emerged out of this and I think they're doing well. Mm. Uh, we have a call-in show on the leaders of tomorrow and a lot of the questions that come in from the FMCG space say, mm. I hire someone who stays with me, say, for six, seven months. I've trained that person. I've spent the money. I've spent the time. They leave for a better opportunity, largely at a startup. And we were talking about digital uh, brands. Mm -hmm. What's your advice? So I think it, there is a war for talent, okay? And all of us should be aware that there is a war for talent. So one is to select the right person. So at the time of interview, you need to be clear that that person will stay with you because you're investing a lot in that person. Because all the management trainees whom we take, they spent I mean, nine months just training. We don't, we hardly get anything. Now we started giving them projects in the training phase also. So there is some return coming out. But after that, I think you need to put them in roles where there is a challenge. And you need to create some roadmap for those individuals in terms of growth opportunities, career plans. So if I take somebody from a management school in the sales function and his desire also is to get a marketing or a brand experience. Then if I sit with that person and say that, okay, one year you spend in sales, after that I rotate to brand one year, then you go maybe at a higher level in sales. So if he sees a certain visibility of his growing and challenge and learning, then I think that will make uh, that person stay with you. I think the culture of the organization also plays a very important role. And culture in any organization is driven by the top. So if you're in a company which is based on meritocracy, which is open, uh, which is um, collaborative, which encourages risk taking, which is empowering. Empowering is a big thing for youngsters. They want to do things on their own rather than every time referring to their boss. So I think you need to create the right culture and you need to create the right roadmap for growth and learning for those youngsters so that um, I mean, they don't even think of going out and the learning is far more important their career uh, growth is more important than just financial 
uh, earnings. Okay. Two last questions. Yes. One, GST. It's yes. changing the very nature of the industry. But my specific question mm. to you is how MSME should prepare for uh, GST? See, I think are, it, GST is going to cover everyone. And uh, I think the government has done a lot of work in terms of training um, individuals. A lot of training programs have been doing not only by the government, by other industry organizations. So I think you have to go through a learning curve in terms of registration, in terms of filing your returns. But I think once that is done, I don't see a situation where, so it will be a short term learning curve, but I don't think it's rocket science for them to say that I have to learn a big thing. You know. What's the outlook looking like for FY18 for the FMCG space? See, I think it's, uh, we're going through some short term disruptions. We went through short term disruption because of demonetization. So the first quarter, April, June has had its impact because of lowering down of uh, stock levels at the trade level. So, but it's okay in my opinion because if you have to look at a long term gain, there will be some short term pain. So I am for one, okay we have to go through the process, let there be some short term disruption but long term it is going to help a lot. Um, next quarter, um, we have to see again there will be some effect of GST and then the third quarter we would compare ourselves with the demonetization effect of the earlier year. Uh, so to that extent, it hopefully it will grow. Uh, a lot will also depend on the monsoon. Um, but I've, I strongly believe that over a period of time, I think the Indian consumer sector um, will grow at a much higher rate. It's a matter of time. I'm not able to predict whether it will happen after six months or sure. one year. But it is looking positive in the long term. It is, I would say it is cautiously optimistic. I am. So it's, and I think it's a matter of time. Uh, we didn't anticipate um, a roadblock because, not a roadblock, but a slowdown because of demonetization. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you have to look at uh, those short term issues which may impact you. But otherwise, I think the whole industry is quite positive about GST. So you're seeing uh, cautious optimism and I'm going to pick up then on the optimistic part of that and end the interview on this note. Thank you so much, Mr. Mariwala, for uh, speaking with us here on the Leaders of Tomorrow. Do remember that if you have any feedback for us or you want to get in touch with us, you can write in on leadersoftomorrowtimesgroup.com. You can reach us on social media using the hashtag LOT on Twitter. Tweet at me personally, in fact, at Sunanda underscore J or reach us on Facebook using our Facebook page, Leaders of Tomorrow on ET Now. Call us on that number that you see on your screen. We promise to have all your questions answered. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.